Thank you very much. This is, a, um, this is an evening um, devoted to the giving and to supporting a great cause. Uh, I thought I would begin, if I may, by telling you a, an anecdote which, uh, which bears on the topic. Uh, it's one of President Reagan's favorite stories, but one that, as far as I know, has not been um, seen in print. And the story involves a man who hears a loud knock on his door. And he opens the door, and it's a fellow from the Salvation Army. And the fellow says, sir, our records show that you have not made a contribution in recent years. And the man says, well, uh, do your records show I've got a son who has Down syndrome? And the fellow says, no. And the man says, well, do your records show I've got a brother who was paralyzed in the Vietnam War? And the fellow says, no. And the man says, well, do your records show I've got a father who's in a nursing home and is in need of constant care? And the fellow says, good Lord, no. And the man says, well, if I won't help them, what makes you think I'm going to help you? This, um, I find it interesting that was one of Reagan's favorite stories. Uh, but this, by the way, is a um, philosophy a little, bit, um, a little bit dear to the heart of Obama. I say this because in, in the film 2016, we, we interview Obama's brother. Uh, this, is, this is George Obama. And uh, what's particularly odd is that Barack Obama's philosophy and the centerpiece of the re-election campaign uh, is the idea of helping the needy, helping the disadvantaged. Uh, and in the film, we have Obama's real brother, but he's living uh, in a hut uh, in a slum in Nairobi. Well, shortly after the film came out, I was in my apartment, and I get a phone call, and I look at it, and it's the area code for Kenya. And I put on the phone, and it's, it's George Obama. And he's 30 years old. He's the youngest son of Barack Obama Sr. And he goes, Dinesh, uh, I'm, I'm at the hospital, and I have a two-year-old son who's in need of uh, health care. He's got a chest uh, infection. Uh, would you be willing to send me $1,000? And I said, George lives in, the, in a rather uh, he's a street smart guy. So I was a little bit suspicious. So I said, George, you're, you're at the hospital. Well, we'll hand the phone to the nurse. Uh, and he did. And it turns out that he was right. He's, uh, he has a son who had a contagion. And so the nurse said, this is legitimate. So I said, OK, George, I'll, I'll send you $1,000. But before I hung up the phone, I said, George, uh, isn't there somebody else you can call? <laughs> and, uh, and George said, uh, no. Uh, and then he said, rather amazingly, he goes, Dinesh, he goes, uh, you're like a brother to me. So let's think about this. See, here you have George Obama, um, a half-brother to the President of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, and a multi-millionaire to boot, a man who on the campaign trail, one of his favorite phrases right out of the Bible is, we are our brother's keeper. Uh, he's actually used that phrase more than 50 times. And here is his actual brother who has a two-year-old kid who needs health care. And um, he can't turn, apparently, to the, to the White House. Um, quite, quite telling, I think, in some ways, about what we're dealing with. And so here we are, gathered together for a, for a good cause. And what is that cause? It's a cause at the center of what America is all about. When we, when we talk about America as a, a nation that celebrates religious liberty, this sounds like some procedural idea, some legal principle. And in many ways, you have to fight for it that way. But for me, the core of the idea of religious liberty isn't just the idea of a procedure. It's ultimately defending Christianity itself. Because it's Christianity, not religious liberty 
that has actually made many of the best things about our world today. It's Christianity. I think as a young boy growing up in India about my, um, my own family, uh, my ancestors, who were, um, who were converts to Christianity. Christianity, by the way, came to India around the fourth century. It has a very old history in India. My family is from Goa, which was a Portuguese colony. Uh, and the Portuguese came to India, and they came to India in the form of colonialism but they also brought with them the missionaries. And some of this was a little bit tough. The missionaries came, they said, with a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other. It was the era of the Inquisition. And yet, interestingly, as I grew up, and I often thought about um, the forced conversion of my ancestors, but as I read a little bit of Indian history, I realized that it actually wasn't so simple. Many of the Indians fled into the arms of the missionaries. Why? Well, because they were at the lowest rungs of the caste system. And in, it was a system in which there was no escape. Uh, no amount of effort or merit could help you. And so when the Christians came and they had a message of universal brotherhood, even if they didn't fully practice uh, that message, nevertheless, the very idea of it was appealing enough that Many of the Hindus who were in the low caste said, I would rather join this team. And so Christianity introduces uh, a powerful new idea uh, into the world, the idea of universal, universal brotherhood. By the way, in most parts of the world, people help their own tribe. But the idea of helping the stranger, someone who is nothing to you, uh, is not only very difficult to explain on a sort of scientific or evolutionary basis, uh, but it's also something that has been uniquely uh, championed in Christianity. When we look at America and the issue of the founding, is America a Christian nation? Very often those debates devolve into things like was, what, were the, what was the religious philosophy or practice of the founders? Did Thomas Jefferson go to church? What I find it particularly interesting is even the founders who were not so Christian, uh, ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were probably two of the more heterodox Christians among the founders. But even they were shaped decisively by Christianity. When Jefferson had a, was dispatched to write the Declaration of Independence and to, to identify where our rights come from, all of them, uh, this man of science, this man of the Enlightenment, this man who would sit with the scissors and, and cut things out of the Bible, this same man, uh, could identify only one source uh, of our rights, and that is the Creator. So even Jefferson uh, located our rights, our economic rights, our political rights, and our right to religious liberty and religious freedom in the idea of, a, of God, of nature's God. We live in, at a time now when America is, is in a rather precarious situation. And I don't just mean economically, I don't just mean politically, but we live at a time in which America has become a, a secular culture. This was not the case um, even 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we lived in a country where Christian principles were taken for granted. And even people who are not Christian abided by them. If you said the Ten Commandments 50 years ago, it didn't matter if you were a Jew or not even Christian. People would agree that's a good way to live. And now by secular culture, I don't mean a culture that is in a way indifferent to religion, indifferent to Christianity. I actually mean a culture that has an ingrained hostility to Christianity. Uh, I'm the president of a college in New York, the King's College. We're a Christian college, uh, very deliberately uh, set up in the middle of the secular city. Uh, and our goal is to train young Christians, equip them to go out into the world, into secular institutions, and, and make a difference. I went to a different college, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, an Ivy League college. 
And as many of you know, a number of the Ivy League colleges, in fact, seven out of eight, were founded explicitly as Christian institutions. Uh, only one of them, Cornell, was not. Uh, and Dartmouth was founded by a Yale clergyman who went up into the woods of New Hampshire. Uh, he said, in order to educate and Christianize the Indians. Uh, how I got there, I'm not really sure. I, I think I might have misread the catalog. <laughs> but well, when I, when I got to Dartmouth, I found that uh, this was a campus that had not only long ago eschewed its Christian foundations, but it was on a kind of war path against Christianity. Um, a few months into my um, freshman year, we were assembled into a kind of uh, gathering or convocation, and one of our deans stood up and said, men and women of Dartmouth, um, look to the right of you, look to the left of you. Uh, one of the three of you will have a homosexual experience before you graduate. Now, you have to admit, I mean, gee, I, I mean, I was a kid from India. So, I mean, I stood there. Um, I looked to the right of me. I looked to the left of me. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I avoid these two guys for the next four years. Uh, but... So today, today we live thoroughly in, in secular culture. And that, and that goes beyond the campaign to separate church and state. Many of you have seen these, the campaign that is sometimes called the new atheism. Uh, and that is these um, atheists out there who are very influential in the media and in universities. Uh, and their goal is not just to take down the Ten Commandments from the state capital, their goal is to eradicate Christianity from society completely. Their goal is to make every Christian feel like an idiot for believing in Christianity. So there is this uh, aggressive uh, atheism out there, which is new. It's very different from 30 years ago when you had uh, Madeleine Murray or O'Hare as a kind of lone atheist warrior. Now you've got a whole atheist kind of A-team out there. And these guys are a very strange phenomenon. Normally, if you don't believe in God, you don't really bother, right? Um, I mean, I don't believe, for example, in unicorns. But I don't go around giving speeches on the topic, debating people on it, writing books called The Unicorn Delusion, uh, The End of Unicorns. I'm saying all this because the new atheists are actually atheist evangelists. They, they're out there to convert people to their cause. They're activists on behalf of, of atheism. And then we see also in our society the emergence of a very aggressive social liberalism that has taken difficult social issues and takes an extreme position on them uh, and institutionalizes that in the political culture. You take a topic, for example, like abortion or gay marriage. Um, these are issues that have been debated for a while, but what we have now is an extreme position that admits of almost no compromise, no debate. We see in the Obama administration a kind of aggression uh, on the issue of gay marriage that we've never seen really before. Uh, we see a championing of abortion rights in which abortion has gone from a difficult decision to now becoming something almost like a sacrament. In other words, there's almost a championing of the abortion right. 